Like some strange bird, the tiny papier-mâché aircraft rose steadily into the air, pushed by a spluttering two-stroke Ford engine. The generals watching below an eyewitness would later remember smiled delightedly as they watched the birth of a weapon which could strike the enemy from the air without any danger to their own pilots. Then something went wrong and the aircraft began to swoop and dive like a kite flying without enough wind. The little aeroplane finally drifted down and crashed a few hundred meters from the guests, much to, to the dismay of the development team. Thus ended more than a hundred years ago, 1913, the very first demonstration flight of the Kettering Bug, the world's first uncrewed aerial vehicle or UAV, which was meant to be capable of delivering up to 100 kilograms of explosives 200 miles away. Earlier this week, an obscure entrepreneur called Elon Musk, yeah, I'm just joking, described fans of the state-of-the-art F-35 combat jet as idiots. Fighter jets operated by human pilots, he claimed, and I quote, are obsolete in the age of drones. He went on, I quote again, fighter jets will be shot down very quickly if the opposing force has sophisticated surface-to-air missiles or drones, as shown by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The only actual use for fighter jets, Musk joked, was, I quote, helping Air Force pilots get laid. There's been a couple of important fallouts from Musk's slightly trollish comments. Large numbers of actual experts on air warfare and the F-35, like Roger Entner and Susan Schreiner, claim the idiot is, in fact, Musk. The technology behind Musk's vision of a robotics-powered battlefield, the experts say, is decades away from being ready for combat deployment. And there's a second political issue. You see, among the F-35's biggest fanboys is a man you might have also heard of, Donald Trump, the president-elect. President-elect Trump is Elon Musk's boss and maybe might not like being described as an idiot. The one thing I have in common with Musk, uh, if his critics are correct, is that I don't know very much about F-35s or combat jets. In this episode of Explorer though, I thought I'd take a look at how UAVs evolved because, as you'll have learned from the story of the Kettering Bug, the idea is quite an old one. In the decades since the UAV has come to have an ever more critical role in battlefields across the world, but how it got there isn't much known. Even as modern air forces are pursuing ever more sophisticated human crewed combat aircraft, there are growing numbers of projects seeking to build totally autonomous fighters and bombers. I'm not even going to try to answer the question of what role uncrewed aircraft will play in the wars of the future. That's because I'm not an astrologer or a prophet. War is just too vastly complex uh, to give a simple answer to what weapons will be used in what future circumstances and when. I'll just try and talk you through the story of UAVs and where things stand today. Launched from a trolley-like contraption that ran on tracks, the Kettering Bug was an ingenious beast. Lifting off, it climbed to its altitude, controlled by a highly sensitive aneroid barometer, a system of cranks and bellows cannibalized from a mechanical piano, maintained altitude using inputs from a gyroscope. The bug, however, relied on the design of its wings alone for directional stability and, winds permitting, tried to maintain a straight line. A mechanical counter determined how many revolutions the propeller had to make before the bug would be over its target. Then a cam would fall into place, the wings would fold back and the bug would dive towards its target like some sort of bird of prey. The bug might just have been deployed in 1914, notwithstanding its failed initial demonstration. But Colonel Henry Arnold, who took the bug to Europe, fell ill with pneumonia and by the time he got better, the war had ended. Lawrence Perry, another weapons designer who is credited with inventing the aircraft autopilot system, had much the same idea as the crew who built the bug. His UAV, the Sperry Aerial Torpedo, registered several successful flights. Five models were constructed by the Curtis Aircraft Company before 1918, uh, but again never went into combat because the war ended. 
The idea that uncrewed aircraft could be used uh, to fulfill high-risk missions is actually a, even a lot older than this. Australian forces tried to bomb their Italian rivals by launching balloons filled with explosives back in 1848. The balloon experiment didn't work very well and some of them were blown back into Austrian lines by the wind. Uh, but that's how ideas germinate and grow. Ten years later, in 1858, surveillance photographs were being taken from uncrewed balloons and even using giant kites. The period between the two world wars saw a lot of UAV development. The first practical quadcopter, yes, the kinds of quadcopters I'm sure some of your kids play with, or may, maybe you do, uh, arrived in 1924, designed by the French engineer Etienne Aubichon. Around the same time, uh, George de Buhezat successfully flew a quadcopter for the United States Army. For their part, the British mated Kettering's bug with revolutionary radio control technology invented by A.M. Lowe. The Royal Aircraft Establishment, the premier British uh, design institution, began building uh, the Larynx Autopilot cruise missile in 1925. Uh, conducting test flights between 1927 and 1929. Britain also developed the Fairy Queen, a radio-controlled target drone constructed from a Fairy 3F uh, float plane in 1931. The remotely piloted DH-82B Queen Bee, a variant of de Havilland's Tiger Moth biplane, revolutionized military target practice. The Americans created their own Curtis N2C2 anti-aircraft target drone in 1937. Controlled remotely from a TG2 mothership plane, the N2C2 was very widely used in naval and air force training. Although remote control and automation weren't sophisticated enough to enable significant combat use by the time of the Second World War, drones did play a role in that gargantuan conflict. In 1942, the United States developed the naval aircraft factory TDN-1, the first drone to be able to take off from an aircraft carrier successfully. The US also applied radio control technology to Boeing B-17 and consolidated B-24 bombers, essentially converting them into flying torpedoes. These experimental platforms required the pilot to jump from the aircraft just before impact. And one mission led to the death of Joseph P. Kennedy, uh, the older brother of the to-be president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. However, the US did find success with one of the earliest combat drones it made, the GB-1 Glide Bomb. Also known as the Grapefruit Bomb, the aircraft's wings allowed it to glide further than a torpedo, which obviously allowed bombers to release it much further away from enemy fire. More than 1,000 GB-1s flew during World War II in 1944 and 1945. The Nazis, meanwhile, hammered the United Kingdom with V-1 cruise missiles capable of flying over 150 miles at speeds of up to 400 miles an hour, not very different from today's passenger jets. Nazi Germany also produced the V-2, the world's first guided ballistic missile. The V-2 traveled close to the speed of sound making it almost impossible to intercept. More than 3,000 were launched at the United Kingdom between 1943 and 1945. Following the end of the Second World War, experiments with UAVs continued. From 1946 to 1948, the United States Air Force flew remote-controlled F-6F Hellcat fighters. B-17 bombers were also flown through radioactive, uh, radioactive clouds, excuse me, to gather data on nuclear weapons tests. Even though crude intelligence gathering aircraft like the U-2 became well known during the close Cold War, drones had also begun to play an important role. Starting in 1962, the United States Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office funded a project codenamed Firefly. The aircraft that emerged, the Ryan T-47 series, uh, or Lightning Bug, operated extensive intelligence gathering missions over Southeast Asia and China. China is known, interestingly, to have recovered variants of the lightning bug during the Vietnam War and eventually reverse engineered them uh, into their own aircraft from 1981 onwards. 
In the 1970s and 1980s, American agencies like the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in conjunction with the private sector and international partners developed the first high altitude long endurance platforms to replace crewed reconnaissance aircraft like the U-2. These efforts resulted in modern UAVs such as the Predator and the Global Hawk. Among the first UAVs to enter global service was the MQ-1 Predator. The Predator, which flew in support of NATO airstrikes in Serbia in 1995, was intended to pro provide the warfighter persistent intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. Though still a technology demonstrator at the time of the war in Serbia, the Predator ended up flying over 600 missions. After 9-11, the aircraft was deployed to Afghanistan and uh, laid the foundations for subsequent models that are now in service. So long before Elon Musk had any known thoughts on the subject, a significant amount of funding and research was already being invested in combat UAVs. From 2016, according to Congressional Research Service uh, documents, contracts had already been awarded for the construction of the B-21 Raider, uh, which can be operated either by a crew or remotely. The aircraft is designed to operate in both conventional environments, but also in nuclear battlefields, where its UAV capabilities would obviously be uh, enormously important, uh, since human crews would likely not be able to survive. Another one of the many aircraft in development is the RQ-180, a bomber-sized UAV. Every significant military power today is working to bring UAVs into more sophisticated combat roles, including air-to-air -air combat and even dogfights. Since 1999, the United States Navy and Air Force have experimented with the X-47 series of aircraft. The X-47B, operated by the Navy, has been used alongside human crewed aircraft since at least 2013 and has successfully performed a range of tasks including mid-air refueling. The X-47 program laid the foundations for the so-called MQ-NEXT program which intends to produce a UAV capable of air-to-air -air combat, uh, especially over the enormous distances of the Pacific Ocean. The point is that many intelligent people other than Elon Musk already seem to have had pretty much the same idea he is posting on Twitter and have been working on it for years if not decades. Publicly available studies conducted by the United States Defense Science Board showed that the path forward for UAV research has been discussed on a granular basis time and again since 2004 at the very minimum. Since 2003, we also know French aviation giant Dassault has been working on the Neuron UCAV demonstrator. This demonstrator is being used to investigate the aerodynamics, stealth, navigation and control algorithms as well as human factors for UAVs uh, in European military operations. It is expected to demonstrate air to ground capabilities, although it is not intended for actual combat missions. Neuron's first test flight took place in 2012 over France and it has recently completed essential combat capability and stealth evaluations. Taranis, uh, designed by British Aerospace Systems, BAE Systems, at the head of a consortium of more than 250 companies, was unveiled in 2010. Taranis is intended to conduct surveillance and intelligence gathering missions and carry out strikes in hostile environments. Initial flight tests took place in late 2013 and early 2014 uh, over the Woomera test range in Australia. Taranis is eventually expected to demonstrate supersonic combat capabilities, uh, bringing it on par with any of, of the jets uh, in use today. Building on the knowledge gained from the Taranis and uh, Neuron programs, the British and French governments have announced a cooperative effort in a $1.5 billion project to develop a future combat uh, air system, the most advanced of its kind, they say, and pretty much what Elon Trump is advocating for. Countries like China are undoubtedly working on their own advanced systems. Uh, one idea Chinese planners hope will offset their technological gap with the West is putting together swarms of low-cost drones 
that they hope will be able to overwhelm these superior uh, defenses. Similar work is also underway in the West, along with research on a range of countermeasures. There are, if you like, two broad flight paths into the future. First, in the short term, state-of-the-art aircraft like the F-35 will be working alongside UAVs, um, and will, which will act as so-called loyal wingmen that augment the skills of human pilots with automated reconnaissance, electronic countermeasures or targeting. In this scenario, the pilot of an F-35-like jet or any other modern combat jet will serve as commander of a small fleet of aircraft, each facilitating the overall mission. The USAF is already trialing the concept of the XQ-58A Valkyrie, uh, as is the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, through a similar program it is developing with Boeing. Little doubt exists though that uncrewed aircraft will have decisive advantages that their piloted versions simply cannot deliver. For example, uncrewed aircraft can be designed uh, to be far more stealthy since they do not require space for a cockpit or to house pilots. Machines can survive far higher gravitational stresses than a human pilot and obviously offer endurance limited only by their mechanical limitations, not the human need for sleep. Of course, UAVs do not have the expenses involved in long years of pilot training nor the tragic loss of human beings in conflict. From tests carried out in 2020, we already know that artificial intelligence agents can defeat highly experienced pilots. In one set of tests, a human pilot, very uh, qualified, lost 5-0 in F-16 simulated dogfights. The, UF, the United States Air Force is expected to soon stage uh, duels between an AI system and a human pilot using real aircraft. Those tests, it hopes, uh, are, will deepen trust in human-machine teaming and create a hierarchical system in which humans would be left free to focus on the highest levels of cognitive functions like combat strategy design, target selection, uh, and the selection of the most appropriate weaponry for a mission. The future isn't quite upon us today though. Scholars like Justin Bronk note that existing UAVs still have limitations in their ability to maneuver in complex real-world air combat situations. Some planners worry about what will happen to UAVs on critical missions if their communications with base stations are disrupted due to enemy jamming. Moreover, to some pilots, air combat needs more than just decision-making skills that AI can replicate. There are no machines, they argue, that can reliably substitute for human creativity and intuition, uh, especially in times of crisis. All these problems will likely be overcome with more time and more research. Uh, the UAV is almost certainly set to be the cutting edge of air forces of the future. Whatever the exact relationship with human operators and decision makers turns out to be. But we should be wary, I think, about predicting the death of manned aircraft systems. Ever since the dawn of warfare, new technologies and techniques have usually been marketed as revolutions, but they end up layering themselves over past ways of combat. The machine gun didn't make the single shot rifle extinct. The tank didn't kill the machine gun. The fighter bomber didn't kill off the tank. Wars of maneuver didn't end static trench fighting. And the guided missile didn't kill off the combat jet. I think you get my drift. The idea that the UAV or robotic battlefield seduces us because it raises the prospect of a kind of bloodless warfare with no risk to ourselves or to civilian bystanders. And to me, that's a dangerous illusion. UAVs, just like every other instrument of warfare, are just a tool. They will not make war less lethal, less bloody or less destructive. And that's why the use of these tools, just like any other tools, must be accompanied by great wisdom and caution. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm contributing editor to The Print.
Thank you for watching this episode of The Print Explorer.